Hi everyone, and welcome to this first lecture for the probability class this semester. I want to use these videos as a way to introduce things typically so that we can spend more time on working through examples in class than going through and having to do a whole lecture kind of thing and get started. I want to be able to get into class and hit the ground running when we're in class. So that's going to be my main goal with these particular videos. Now this one's going to be a little bit longer because I want this one to be a good introduction so that I'm not having to spend a lot of time doing a bunch of definitions in class on the first day of class. I want us to be able to hit that, like I said, hit the ground running and get some stuff done this semester. The goal, at least my goal, is to get through all of the course content by Thanksgiving break so that when this university uh, moves over to online learning the last two weeks, we're actually done with learning for the semester. So that's why I'm doing the supplemental videos to make up for that lost time that we're going to have for those last two weeks of the semester. But I think uh, the trade-off for being able to be done at Thanksgiving and have most everything done face-to-face -face will serve everyone better. So anyway, Let's go ahead and go through these uh, first properties of probability. So you've heard of the word probability, I'm sure, lots of times. You've probably seen some probability ideas already prior to this class. So, but let's just lay down some preliminary definitions and then illustrate the definitions by way of example. So the first thing we have is what we refer to as an experiment. So this isn't like your experiment that you think about going doing a lab and chemistry class or anything like that. An experiment is just any procedure that can be repeated. So that's an important part is a procedure that you can do over and over and over and over again. And actually, that's one of the concepts that we're going to talk about quite a bit is being able to do something over and over and over and over again and what happens in the long run. And then be able to record what the outcome is. You don't want to do something and then not know what the the outcome of that particular thing that you did was. So you need to be able to record the outcome. So that's what we mean by an experiment. A random experiment is something where we can, cannot predict the outcome with certainty. <clears throat> I mean, there will be obviously some predictions that uh, people make predictions all the time. You see predicting of the weather. Um, actuaries predict the probabilities that certain events will happen that will cause loss for uh, car accidents, um, home damage due to fire, those kinds of things. That's how insurance premiums are set. So certainly you make predictions, but you're not 100% certain that those predictions will come true. You hear, you know, a 60% chance of rain for the day. I mean, that gives you a level, a level of certainty, but not 100% certain that something's going to happen. So that's what we mean by a random experiment. Sample space. That just means that if you take all the possible outcomes of a random experiment, whatever that experiment happens to be, if you write down what all the possibilities are from that experiment, that's what your sample space is. And typically we'll denote that with a capital letter S for obvious reasons. And then an event. So by an event, we just mean a piece of the sample space or using the words from set theory, a subset of the sample space, so a part of the sample space. So that's all we mean by event. And typically what we're interested in is the probability that an event happens. Okay, So that's where we're headed. <clears throat> all right, so let's do an example just to illustrate what these definitions mean. So our experiment in this case is flip a coin twice and then record the outcome of each flip. So you're going to flip it twi two times and get the outcome. So certainly this is a repeatable experiment. If you have a coin, you could repeat this experiment all day long. Flip it twice, record the result. Flip it twice, record the result. So on down the line. So it's certainly repeatable. And it's certainly random because you have no idea with certainty if you're going to have heads twice or tails twice or whatever, right? You don't have it with certainty. You can't predict with certainty how a, head, a coin is going to come up when you flip it. All right, so what's the sample space? Well, we said this is done twice in succession, so you could do heads on the first one, heads on the second one, so we'll denote that HH. You can also do heads, then tails, tails, then heads, tails, then tails. So you've got these four outcomes that you can have when you, uh, for this particular sample space. So those are your outcomes that you could possibly have, so we just wrote those down. 
put them in a set, that's our sample space. All right, so let's look at some different examples of events. So say you had flipping two heads. Okay, well, that event would just be the set HH. So that is a subset, it's a piece of the sample space. If we did flipping exactly one head, well, there's two ways that can be done. You could do heads first and then tails, or tails first and then heads. Again, however, notice that this is a subset of the sample space. What about flipping three tails? Well, we're only flipping the coin twice. So flipping three tails, that event is the empty set. This is an impossible event, okay? which is, cannot possibly happen. So the empty set represents that particular event. All right, let's do a few more definitions. Okay, so let's say that we have uh, events denoted here by A1, A2, all the way out to AN. So these are just representing events. And we'll use E's or A's usually for events. Sometimes you'll see other letters, but A or E is one that we'll start with. E for event and A because it's the first letter in the alphabet. So here we have these events, A1 out to AN. Let's suppose that whenever there are di different events, so say A1 and A2, or A4 and A7, whenever they're different events, so that's what, says, that's what this whenever I is not equal to J, whenever they're different, they have no overlap. The intersection of the two events is empty, so that they can't have anything in common. Then we say the events are mutually exclusive. Going the other way, if I have events that are uh, such that when you take the union of all of them, you get the entire sample space, then we get what's referred to as an exhaustive set of events. So what that means is that no matter what the outcome is, it, is in one, it, it lies in one of these events. That's what we mean by exhaustive events. All right, so let's do another example illustrating these definitions. So let's say we have the experiment that we're going to roll a six-sided die one time and result, uh, record the result. Well, the sample space, that's pretty easy to compute. If it's a six-sided die, it probably has outcomes one, two, three, four, five, six on it. So that will be your sample space. <clears throat> so let's look at two different events. Let's say that A is the event rolling an even number. Excuse me, A1 is the event rolling an even number, and A2 is the event rolling an odd number. Now, it is not, with a single roll of the die, it is not possible to roll an even number and an odd number at the same time. So that means the intersection of those two events is empty, which means that those two events are mutually exclusive. Okay, so that's the first part. Since I cannot roll an even and an odd at the same time, that's what makes mutually exclusive. Well, how about exhaustive? Well, being in the event rolling an even number is one, excuse me, is two, four, and six, and rolling an odd number is one, three, and five. Well, if you, when you roll a die, you've either got to roll an even or roll an odd. It's the only choices. So that means it's good, those two events are exhaustive events for the entire sample space. Let's look at another example here. So let's say that A1 is the event rolling a prime number, and A2 is the event rolling a multiple of three. Well, looking at the sample space, the only prime numbers that we have are two, three, and five. And the multiples of three that we have are three and six. So the A1 is the set two, three, five. The A2 is the set three, six. Notice that A1 and A2 have overlap. They have three in common. So they cannot be mutually exclusive. So A1 and A2 are not mutually exclusive. And also, there are some numbers missing from the sample space, right? One is in not, neither of them, and four is in neither of them, right? Neither of them can, can contain one, neither of them contain four, so they're not exhaustive either. Okay? So this is neither mutually exclusive nor exhaustive. All right, so let's define probability. So here's the ideas. This is going to be our technical definition, and we'll go through what the ideas are uh, as we go along here. So let's let S be the sample space of the experiment, and we're going to define a function P going from the power set of S. So this means the set of all subsets of S. That's what the power set means. Going from the power set of S to the, the uh, set 0, 1, 
with the following properties. Okay, so the first one says that if A is an element of the power set, or all that means is that A is a subset of S, or in the language of what we've been using, if A is an event, then the probability of A is greater than or equal to zero, and that makes sense up here, right? This says, this as our function notation, this says we take an input that's an event, and an output has to be a number between zero and one. Well, for, that means for any event, when I plug it into this function, there's no way to get a negative number. And again, we're doing ideas of probability, right? You can't have a less than zero chance of something happening. I mean, people may say that hyperbolically, but you don't really mean that. You cannot have a less than zero chance of something happening. All right, let's look at the second property that we want. This property says that when you plug in the whole sample space into the function, you get one. Again, think about this in terms of probability. What's the probability that the sample space happened? Well, if you do an experiment, the outcome has to necessarily be in the sample space. So the probability that the sample space occurs is always one, or a 100% chance that it happened. All right, so then the next one is a little bit more complicated. This says that if we have mutually exclusive events, that's what that, remember the A, A I intersect A, J is empty whenever I is not equal to J. That means they're all mutually exclusive. Uh, this could be an infinite set of things too. Doesn't have to be finite. But it, this says that the probability of the union of those events is the same as the sum of the probability of the events. Okay. So this means that the probability function breaks up over unions as long as it's mutually exclusive events. This is going to help us actually calculate some probability stuff later. So this is an important property for probability functions to have. And so that's exactly the name we use for this. Then P of A is called the probability of the event A. So let's do another example here. Let's go back to the example where we flipped a coin twice in succession and recorded the result. So the sample space again, we've seen this before. What about the probability or the, uh, the event flipping two heads? Well, let's see what the probability of that is. Well, each of these outcomes is equally likely, right? The coin has no, uh, always uh, when you flip it, there's the same amount of chance that it lands heads as tails. So each of these four outcomes is equally likely. So one of the outcomes is two heads out of the four possibilities. So the probability of, it, of uh, flipping two heads here is one fourth. What about exactly one head? Well, there's two possibilities here out of the four that have exactly one head. So the probability is one half. How about the probability of at least one head? Well, here's both two heads, here's one head. There's, so there's one, two, three possibilities out of the four. That's flipping at least one head, so we get three fourths. We could have used that mutually exclusive idea like we talked about in that last property for probability functions. Flipping at least one head can be thought of as exactly one head or exactly two heads. And or is the English way to think about union. These are certainly uh, mutually exclusive. You can't flip exactly one head and exactly two heads at the same time. And we're doing a union since so it's one or the other. So our probability of A could be thought of as exactly one head, which is one half, exactly, and plus uh, exactly two heads, which is one fourth. All right, let's talk about some theorems that are going to help us do some calculations before we end up doing some examples. So, uh, what if you, uh, the first theorem is that if A is an event, then the probability of the complement of A, so this means that the, the event doesn't happen. It's everything that's not in the set. <coughs> Pardon me, never, not, in the, uh, not in the event, if you will, not in the set. That's what the complement means. Well, remember that uh, the complement is basically the opposite of what the original event was. So it may kind of makes sense that you would do one minus probability of A here because when you put these two things together, either A or not A had to happen, right? Either the event happened or it didn't happen. Those are mutually exclusive and exhaustive, which means you have to get the entire sample space, which remember has probability one. All right, and that's exactly how the theorem goes. Excuse me, that's exactly how the proof goes. So 
We know that the sample space is certainly a union, a complement, because again, if you're in the sample space, you're either in the event that you're worried about or not. They're certainly uh, mutually exclusive because you can't be in the event and not be in the event at the same time. So that's why the intersection is zero, uh, the empty set. So now let's just go through and use the probability properties. Uh, so I start with the fact that sample space is this. Now I'll take the probability of both sides. On the left hand side, we know the probability of the entire space is one. And since they're mutually exclusive, we can break up the probability over each piece by replacing the union with a sum and then just manipulate the equation. So that gives us the result we were looking for. Let's look at another theorem. This one says that for any experiment that we have, the probability of getting the empty set is zero. Well, this one follows right directly from the previous theorem because we know that the complement of the sample space is the empty set. Remember, the sample space is the set of all possible outcomes. Well, that means no matter what, an outcome is in this sample space. So the complement has to be the empty set because there's no, there's no outcome that's not in the sample space. So now we just use the previous theorem here. The probability of being in the complement of the sample space is one minus the probability that you're in the sample space. And then we know the probability of the sample space is one. You're guaranteed to land in the sample space so you get zero for the empty set. A couple more theorems here. A and B are events with uh, A as a subset of B. Then the probability of A is less than the probability of B. That makes sense, right? If you've got one event inside of another, it's not gonna have a greater chance of happening than the bigger set. So this is just says that the biggest that the probability that A can be, if it's inside of B, is the same as the probability of B. So this one requires us to be a little bit creative with our sets to be able to use the probabilities or the properties that we want. All right, so notice that the probability, or excuse me, notice that the set B is made up of the set A, because it's inside of it, and along with everything that's in B that's not in A. So think about what that means. If you're an element of B, you're either in A or you're not in A, okay? No matter what element it is, you're either in A or you're not. Since you're also in B, if you're in A, you're good, you're still in B, or if you're not in A, you still have to be in B. So that's where this intersection part comes from. And also notice that these two things have to be mutually exclusive because you can't be in A and A complement at the same time. So this is kind of our exhaustive idea. It's not the entire sample space, but these two events take up all of B, and they are also mutually exclusive. So now we're going to use our properties of our probability function. Okay, so this is just stating the first piece. Again, apply the probability function to both sides. This is now, these are now mutually exclusive events. So I can break up the probability function and change the union to a plus sign. And now one of the properties that we know is that this is non-negative. Non it could be zero, but it's not negative. So this means that we have to get to the probability of B, we have to take the probability of A and add something to it. So the probability of B is greater than or equal to the probability of A because this thing can't be negative. It might be zero, in which case they're equal, but if it's greater than zero, then we, have a strict, we would have a strictly greater than sign here. Then in any event, the probability of B here has to be at least as big as the probability of A. So that leads us to our next little result. So that for any event A, the probability that the event occurs is less than or equal to one. That makes sense for uh, just if you think about how people usually use the word probability as a percent chance of happening, certainly something cannot have a greater than 100% chance of happening, no matter how often somebody likes to say, give 110% or anything along those lines. This is as good as it gets. There's a 100% chance that it happens. So this one's pretty easy to prove because we know that A is a subset of S. Any event is a subset of the sample space. 
and certainly the probability of the, of the sample space is one, so all we're doing up here is just replacing this right-hand side of the inequality with a one. So there's a special name for this type of theorem. Notice that this theorem followed directly from the previous theorem, right? There wasn't a lot to prove at all. All we did was just replace the B with S, and that was it. So this is referred to as a corollary of the previous theorem. Corollaries are still theorems. They just have a special name because they follow directly from the previous one. All right, a couple more theorems, and then we'll do some examples, I promise. Okay. So this first one, now we've talked about how to break up probability over unions if they are mutually exclusive. But this is a more general statement says that we don't have to have mutually exclusive events to be able to still break up probabilities over unions. So this says that if you do a probability of A union B, that's the same as the probability of A plus the probability of B, and then we have to subtract off the probability of the intersection. Think about it in terms of counting especially if you've had a discrete math course, <clears throat> pardon me. If I want to count up the things that are in A or in B, <coughs> pardon me, I can count up everything in A and count up everything in B and add those two numbers together. <clears throat> but what happens in that case is that when you've counted up everything in A and counted up everything in B, you've counted up the things that they have in common twice. So you have to subtract off the double count. So if you've seen discrete and done the, the how many things are in a union counting argument, this is exactly the same idea. It's just turned into a kind of a percentage of things that are in both, or in a union, I mean. All right, so let's set this up. So let's write A union B as... A union, and then A complement intersect B. So let's think about what's going on here. I want A union B. So certainly if I'm going to get everything that's in A union B, I need to throw A in there. But what else do I need to throw in? I need to throw anything that's in B that wasn't in A to begin with. So this is everything that's in B that's outside of A. So in this case, then, we have mutually exclusive events right? A and A complement intersect B are mutually exclusive events. So when I do the probability here, I can split up the probability over the union as that. All right, so now I need to play with this piece. Okay, so let's look at B. B now is everything that's in B and A along with everything that's in B and not A. Because B is broken up into two pieces. If you're in B you're either in A or you're not. So that's all this is saying. And again, these are mutually exclusive because you can't be in A and A complement at the same time. So same idea. And now think of B as a union of two things. I can break the probability up over the union and replace it with a plus sign. So now I can get something here, an expression here for the probability of A complement intersect B by subtracting over the A intersect B piece. So I get the probability of A complement intersect B is the probability of B minus the probability of A intersect B, and then just substitute this back in up there. And that gives us our result. So all we're doing is just taking this piece right here and subbing it in right here. So this gives us our result. But I think it's, it, it, no matter what the proof is, I think it's just a little bit easier of thinking about it in terms of counting. If I want to count everything that's in the union, I count everything that's in A, I count everything that's in B, but I've double counted everything that's in both because I counted it once for when it was in A and once when it was in, in it for B. All right, we have a similar theorem here for the probability of a union of three sets. And I won't read the whole thing. You can see what you do, though. All right, so we're going to, I'm going to leave this as a theorem, or excuse me, I'm leave this as a theorem. Leave this as an exercise. But the hint I'm going to give you is to rewrite this union of three things as a union of two. Go back and use the previous theorem, and then you're going to have a probability of a union of two things and do the same result. So I'll leave that for something for you to practice. What I want to get to is a couple of examples of what's going on here. All right. So we have a survey of 1,000 people. 80% of them like walking. 60% of them like biking. 
and all of them, like at least one of the two activities, what is the probability that a random, what is the probability that a random chosen person likes biking, but not walking? All right, well, let's get some letters in here to represent some things. So let's let W be the percentage of people who like walking, and B be the percentage of people who like biking. Very, very creative there, I know. So then the probability that W happens is 0.8, converting the 80% to a decimal. Same thing here with the probability that uh, biking happens, probably they like biking, I mean, is 0.6. Okay, so this is biking, but not walking. So we want the probability of B intersect W complement. Just remember that, okay? All right, so this says that at least, everyone likes at least one of the two activities. So certainly that means that the probability of their union is one. So let's play with this for a minute. Probability of W union B, previous theorem says that that's probability of W plus the probability of B minus the probability of their intersection. Plugging in the numbers that were given and then subtract. So this says the probability that W intersect B is 0.4. It's not quite what we want. This would be walking and biking. We, we want biking but not walking. Okay. All right. So this is a lot of a lot of uh, math symbols for what seems it should be a very very straightforward concept here. I'm going to explain this in a second, but let's think about this. This is the people who like to bike and walk. We want bike and not walk. Well, we know that biking all together is 0.6. Of that 0 0.6, 0 0.4 like to, buy, uh, like to walk as well, so if I subtract, I should get 0.2 for our final answer, the bike and not walk. Okay. All right, well, let's go through this piece. We know that B is made, and this is exactly what I just said, but there's a lot of pieces here just uh, for the math part, just making it precise. B is made up of things that are B and W, or things that are in B and not W. So it's made up of those two pieces that are also mutually exclusive. That was what I said in words before I went back through these symbols again, right? B is made up of the things in W and not in W. And those two pieces are mutually exclusive. Since they're mutually exclusive, the probability breaks up over the union. And now I can plug in the different pieces, 0.6 for probability of B, 0.4 for probability of W intersect B, and we get the probability of W complement intersect B is 0.2. To another example here, this is just playing with the formulas. Probability of A union B is 0.7, probability of A union B complement is 0.9, and it wants us to find the probability of A. All right, so let's use these formulas to help us get some results here. Probability of A union B is 0.7, and I know I can rewrite the probability of A union B in this fashion. Now let's plug in some numbers. This is 0.7, and I'm good to go with that. I can do the same thing for the other one, right? I've got a union. I split it up in this fashion. I know that a couple of things. I know that the uh, probability of A union B complement is 0.9, and then the probability of B complement is 1 minus the probability of B. That's using another theorem that we had. Okay, so let's add these two equations together. Notice that we add them, and, we're, and the reason I know to add here as opposed to do something else is I'm trying to find the probability of A. Adding these two equations together leaves probability of A in there and gets rid of probability of B. It helps me eliminate something. <clears throat> Pardon me. So to get to that point, then, I add. This is what you get. 0.7 and 0.9 is 1.6. I've got two probability of A's. I've got a 1 here. These canceled, and now I have these two pieces. Let's look at this piece here. We have everything that's in A and in B. This is everything that's in A and not in B. If I put those two pieces together, I get A, right? And they're mutually exclusive. 
So I can use that result we've been using several times in reverse. I can put these two pieces back together and get probability of A there. Because this is if I factor out a minus sign, I've got uh, probability of A intersect B plus probability of A intersect B complement. Right? I'm just using the result in reverse from what we've done before. And then notice here that you get probability of A is 0.6. So that's just the reason why I wanted to do these particular uh, examples is just to play around with the formula some to see how show you how they work. Let's do a little bit bigger example. Now I'm going to think about this in a couple of different ways. All right, so we've got lots of viewing habits for people watching different sports, and it wants the percentage of the group that was watch none of them. All right, so. We can use the given information to help us with uh, what we want here. So this would be the probability that you've watched at least one of them, right? Gymnastics or baseball or soccer. And this is how we break those apart. That particular uh, probability of the union of three things apart. And now I believe we have pieces for all of those, right? Uh, I've got these two backward, but that's okay. I mean, it's going to add up to the same thing. Probability of gymnastics was 0.28. Probability of baseball was 0.29. Soccer is 0.19. Gymnastics and baseball, 0.14. Gymnastics and soccer, 0.12. Sorry, gymnastics and soccer was 0.1. Baseball and soccer is 0.12. I've got the right numbers, just in the wrong order relative to the formula I've written down. And then uh, all three, that's what this intersection represents, is 0.08. And you simplify and you get 0.48. This isn't quite the answer we want, because we want the probability that none of the three sports. But again, notice how I said this when I started up with I said this is the probability that of at least one of them, right? gymnastics or baseball or soccer. That's just at least one. Could be more, but that's at least one. What's the opposite of at least one? That's none. And we opposite as far as probabilities and set theories go is complement. So none is represented by the complement of the union. So we can do one minus the 0.04, uh, 1, eh, 0.48 to get 0.52. <clears throat> now, a way that I like to think about these sometimes is with a Venn diagram. So I would have a circle here. This is called a Venn diagram, where I'm using these circles to represent the sets and the relationships. Here is a circle that represents gymnastics. This is a circle that represents baseball, a circle that represents soccer. We know that 0.8% like them all. So that's why we had 0 0.408 here. Uh, 0.14 liked gymnastics and baseball. That's this whole sliver all the way between these two. If the whole thing was 0.14 and this is already 0.08, this one would be 0.06. Likewise, baseball and soccer was 0.12. At least I hope it was. We're going to use it for this illustration since I have it on this Venn diagram. This whole thing represents baseball and soccer. We've already done 0.08 of it. So 0.04 was the rest of the sliver. Likewise here, gymnastics and soccer was 0.1. 8, uh, 0.08 is already taken up, so 0.02 is the rest. And the way we're getting these numbers out here now, <coughs> pardon me, is because uh, we know that the gymnastics was 28%, but we've already if we've already filled in these three, 0 0.08, 0 0.06, 0 0.02 is 0.16, plus 0.12 gives me 0.28. That's how I got the 0.12. This was 0.29. 0 0.06, 0 0.08, 0 0.04 gives you 0.18, so we get 0.11 there. Uh, soccer was 0.2, no, wait, must be 0.19, because we got 0.08 plus 0.04 plus 0.02 is 0.14, and then 0.05 for what's remaining. All right, so this Venn diagram, of course, remembers, uh, it represents the entire sample space. Well, we've, all, we've filled in the pieces that are on the inside. There's still one more region that's out here outside the circles. If we add these up, we get 0 0.12, 0 0.06 is 0 0.18, 0 0.29, 0 0.31, 0 0.39, 0 0.43, 0 0.48. 
That's inside the circles. We want what's outside the circles, so we'll also subtract it from 1 to get 0.52. All right, so hopefully this gives you a little bit of introduction into probability. We'll do some more of these in class. Uh, but again, like I said, I want us to get a head start on these. Now, again, I'm, I'm going to ask you to watch videos before class on a regular basis, pretty much before each class, maybe not necessarily every single class, but almost every class I'm going to ask you to watch a video ahead of time. But those videos will probably be closer to the 10 to 15 minute range rather than when I'm at 35, 36 minutes now. So this will be the longest one most likely unless we go completely online and then I might have some longer ones to go along. But anyway, I will see you in class. I hope uh, you enjoy the video and uh, of course feel free to ask me questions anytime you want.